Welcome to the Just Fly Performance Podcast. For today's show, I have guests Hunter Eisenhower and Mike Sullivan. If there's one thing that has completely changed my approach to supplementation, it's been finding performance herbalism. Herbalism is different than your typical supplements, particularly because herbalism works by harnessing the power of nature. It involves using tried and tested, high-grade, well-sourced herbal compounds to make a difference in your energy, strength, boost your hormonal system, and improve your overall vitality. That's what today's sponsor, Lost Empire Herbs, can bring to you. Whether it's through Shiliagit Resin, which has been highly recommended by many coaches for improved strength, mushroom tinctures for immune support, combination packages such as the Phoenix Formula, which is one of my favorites, Lost Empire Herbs has the supplements that will help you in achieving your performance training goals. If you want to check out some of my favorite herbs, you can head to lostempireherbs.com slash justfly and use the code JOEL15 at checkout. That's J-O-E-L-1-5 at checkout for 15% off. Lost Empire Herbs is a great company and I hope you get a chance to check them out. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. Thanks for tuning in. It's great to have you here. One of my favorite topics uh, of discussion is athletic speed, reactivity, and elasticity. Basically, the things that we can do to train athletes to help them to be fast and reactive on the field, as well as how to assess those abilities. And for that topic today, I'm excited to dig into that with Hunter Eisenhower and Mike Sullivan. Hunter and Mike were both strength coaches back at UC Davis in the past. Uh, they also run Move the Needle Human Performance and have an awesome podcast there. Uh, Hunter Eisenhower has had several stops on the college and pro basketball tour, and he is now the head of men's basketball performance at Arizona State University. Mike Sullivan now works in the private sector as a sports performance coach for TC Boost Training Center in the Chicago, Illinois area. Today, we'll be getting into speed training, jump training, reactivity, elastic force production, and uh, aliveness in play. It's like a, um, a, a conglomerate of some of my absolute favorite topics. These guys are so insightful and curious, and it was really great uh, getting inside their process. And I know you guys will enjoy this podcast. Let's get to episode 384 with Hunter Eisenhower and Mike Sullivan. So I heard there was some sort of like strength coaching decathlon, sports performance decathlon when you guys were at Davis together. Like, well, first tell me about it. And then who won? Who, yeah. uh, who edged out the other in that, uh, in those event series? Well, we did a, uh, it was like, a, we had, we had three different offices and each office was comprised of, of two different people on our strength staff. So we just did teams of two office versus office. Um, and I, th I think we had 10 events on her and they yeah, were all a combination ten, of ten. sprinting and jumping. And there was some strength stuff, but it wasn't like squat or bench. It was like neutral grip pull up with the most weight attached. Well, we did, do a, weight. we did do a one rep max bicep curl. That was like the most meathead we did, uh, yeah. competition we had. That's a pretty awful yeah, event. Like clean that's snatch, awesome. <laughs> sprint, for you know. And uh, so I think we had 10 events and then we just did some kind of point accumulation. I believe, I believe Burke and I won. Yeah, is you that, did. Is that confirmed, Hunter? We did. Uh, or they did. I think the offices were split up pretty evenly. Um, we did, yeah, we did 10 events. I just remember that we did a, a, the one rep max chin up. You got three attempts and my partner ended up like not getting any of his three attempts and it completely screwed us over for that competition. So we like, that's probably why we lost. We were probably going to win it. Well, then uh, Burke and his, I mean, shout out to Burke. If I, if I, if he listens to this and I get wrong, what his age was, I apologize to Burke, but I think he was like 41 or 42. And he, he trained for a while, but we had our max rep overhead squat, rear fill, or max rep overhead rear fill base squat. And he hit 225. Which was which incredible. Which was shame. I mean, it, Right. Unbelievable. Um, but yeah, we had all kinds. I think uh, one of our one of our staff members, Marcus, I'm pretty sure he bicep curled the same as he cleaned and snatched. So that was uh, that was tough for him. But but yeah, it was super fun. And, and I think I think Burke and I, Burke and I beat, beat everybody out for athleticism. That's kind of like watching those. Um, like if you watch the, watch the strongman competitions, at least back in the 2000s or whatever, um, I would watch them on ESPN. And it seemed like the if they had something that was like a clean and press, like the American strongmen were pretty good. But some of these Euro guys were just straight up muscling yeah. it up, like literally like an upright row to their chest and then getting You could tell they hadn't done that before, but it was still like they were still working with 300 plus pounds like that. It was really amazing. Um, you know, as you were talking about that, well, one, actually, I was remembering that 
my first year at Cal, there was actually a, it was like three strength coaches versus three interns. And mm-hmm. it was, um, it was like jumping. It was like vertical jump, uh, one step vert, and then like some weight room, like clean squat. Um, I forget. I don't think we did bench. We might've done something else. And it was funny because we, we tracked like improvement over, I don't know, two or three months and we did the strength coaches improve more, did the interns improve more. And by the end of that, my standing vert was legit. It was, um, at about age 30, it was about the best it had ever been. But then I remember I went in the gym to do dunks. Like, I think I've told this story before on this podcast, but like after it was all over, I went in the gym to do dunks and I, my running, like actual running uh-huh. dunk was horrible. Like it was like, wow, my were my difference, my differential between my like standing and running when I was like in college or high school was probably about 12 to 14 inches um, between the standing and the running. I would say at that point, it was probably like three. <laughs> it was just maybe even less. I, I imagine you're a one foot, you're a one foot takeoff guy, right? Yeah. Um, naturally, yes. I've shifted into more of a two yeah. over time and kind of experimented with that. But uh, you know what actually would be really cool for strength staffs would be to do something like that every year, but then change the events every year. Kind of like almost that like expert generalist, like maybe one year it's like kettlebell bent press, um, like just kind of like some of the, maybe you got to throw a couple of like strongman things, maybe take something from strongman, something from track. Um, it, you know, it'd be interesting to come up with that on maybe a yearly or bi-yearly basis just to get people, you know, into more of that generalist mindset or something like that. It'd be, that'd be fun too. It'd be interesting to see that. To your point about the the vert and then the the approach jump, I think about this often is back when I played basketball, I like I played at a division two school. We like didn't really have like a legit strength coach. So we barely trained. And when we trained, it was like, hey, we're gonna go in after practice and do incline bench and like chin ups. And I've never jumped higher off I'm I'm like a one foot jumper too. I've never jumped higher off one foot and like just like throwing down different dunks and warm ups, And then once I got done playing basketball and I got into this field and I just started like training, training, training. And I was like on a jump mat doing uh, vertical jumps and just like lifting, lifting, lifting. I went back after probably a year and a half of like taking pretty much just a complete time off from basketball and then tried to jump again. And it was noticeably worse. And it was incredible to think like I barely trained in college and jumped the best I've ever jumped. I just trained for a year and a half and now I can like barely dunk. And now I'm like back on the path of trying to get that athleticism back, but I'm older now and I probably lost half of it. So like, but it's, it, it is really interesting that you said that because I experienced the exact same thing. And it's kind of like frustrating because I was like, I wish I could have kept that athleticism that I had in college because to me that felt so much cooler than anything I can do now. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, when I was, uh, when I was, when I first got here and I was training like really hard and I was, I decided that I wanted to get like a high approach jump and I'm a two foot jumper and I got up to like touching like 10 foot eight. But as I was like training hard for that, I was like lifting a lot. I was, I was doing some running and sprinting. I tore my, my, my right meniscus. I'm not even sure how, but I started having like severe knee pain, especially when I was like lifting. And the, and I realized that the only thing I could do was I could run and I could jump, but like bilateral lifting, I couldn't do it. Just hurt my knee too much. And so I was like, well, I guess my hopes of, being a great two foot approach jumper is, is done. So for like a year straight, I didn't really do any bilateral lifting because I couldn't just hurt. I just sprinted and jumped. And then like, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, I was like, let me do a couple approaches just to see how it feels. And I was like up way higher than I've ever felt before. I was like, maybe I should have just not been doing all that bilateral strength stuff anyway to try to improve my athleticism. Cause I felt so much bouncier and my actual standing for it was up as well. So. Yeah. With, um, with some of the competitions too, did you guys do like a score table? Like, like decathlons, like zero through a thousand. Like, how did that? Was that scored like that? I'm trying to remember how we did it. I think it was just yeah, wasn't question. it just like whoever won the competition got a point. So I like think whoever, it was like event to event. Yeah, yeah. it's like if you won an event, you got a point, or if you yeah you won, you got two points. If you got second, you got one point. If you didn't, if yeah. you got last, you got zero points or whatever. Yeah. And the total accumulation of ten events was the overall winner. Gotcha. Yeah. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. That makes sense. Like I, I like doing scoring table or thinking about scoring tables. Um, there was a, uh, with football, um, like I didn't work with the high school football team. That was, um, Ty Leash who used to work at, um, Evo fit and he worked with a local football team. And one day we had like this just whiteboard chat kind of based off of, I think I had done a podcast with Tony Holler not too long before that, talking about like the bands you get on your wrist, like you get mm. like the 22 mile an hour club, 23, 24. Yeah, yeah. And 
I think, you know, if it was me 15 years ago, 10 years ago, I would have kind of discounted how much that's valued by the athletes and also how motivating it is and how important that motivation is to those X factor things that get you running faster and moving better. And so we had this whiteboard session where it was a 40 yard dash standing broad jump. And I think bench to make the football coaches happy and it's football, right? So, but we, we came up with a table like zero through a thousand points for each of those. And then they, they would get like a band for their total, like the max is 3000. And then you get a band for this level band for 1700, this level for 18 or whatever it was. And it went over like really well. Like the players really loved it. Like the 40 times dropped like rocks. Like, I mean, it was, and I'm sure that was just playing good training too, but I think there's also just that inherent motivation. And I know in track, that's like pretty popular is like a quadrathon. We did this in the fall when I was in track, like you get, you do standing broad jump, standing three broad jumps, uh, backwards overhead shot put, throw 16 pounds as far as you can backwards over your head off like a little block. Um, and then 30 meter dash. And you got like a zero through a thousand or something, or maybe a zero through a hundred score and you'd add it up. And I kind of think, you know, too, I know a lot of track programs use that in the fall, but I also wonder if there'd be value too in, in doing almost like a bi-yearly, like just so people don't get hung up on the same score sometimes too. Mm -hmm. And then like, I was even thinking, how would you do that? Like if it was like, I was uh, having a discussion with a coach about, well, how would you do that for baseball pitchers? Like a baseball pitching, um, you know, quadrathon, like here's four weight room KPIs. You get a score zero through a thousand. Like if it's off season, um, like that kind of idea is just running through my head. So you guys got my mind going, sorry, I'm not going <laughs> to ramble on about this, but I just think there's so many like off season training possibilities that could be a little bit more of the spe uh, SPE, like special prep exercises where people could have a lot of fun too. You know, we love competing in scores and wristbands or shirts or whatever. So that's like besides the thousand pound club or the, you know, whatever it is in lifting too. Not to like take it back well, to Davis, but we had a, we had a, again, Jeff Berg, maybe we should have him on this podcast very like innovative mind and he works with football, but like does some like outside of the box stuff. And one thing that he did that I'm, I'm taking from him and eventually going to try to implement here is like a scoring system for all like our speed stuff. So like we tracked every rep who won a rep, who ran whatever the fastest flying 10 of that day. And it was just a scoring system. And we like really pushed it on the guys like, Hey, this guy's leading. He like sent out scores. He sent out the top three and guys are already like as you know and most people know like especially with high level athletes they're going to be very competitive especially in like racing and jumping and stuff mm -hmm. but it added like a new level of incentive for the like speed work that we did and it was just a scoring system we did all all uh off season and something like that drives just a little bit more intent and i think you just get like a little bit more out of uh athletes if you're able to do something like that and it was like a, it was a tough operation. It wasn't easy, like tracking every single winner of every single sprint during an off season, like training phase. But I think stuff like that is super productive. And on a small scale, like when I got here and we were jumping on the force plates, even just, I didn't write any, like I haven't written anything down, created anything, given out wristbands, but I just have like a 50 club and it's just like guys that jump 50 centimeters. And all I do is hype guys up that are in the 50 club. And it like, if a guy's at 47, he's like, Oh, I gotta get the 50 club. Gotta get the 50 club. And then if a guy like hits it, then he's talking crap to other guys like, and it just that little framework of like me saying a 50 club and creating like this, this achievement just drives intent so much more. So on a small scale, it works. And then if you can implement that on a bigger scale, like, man, the intent that you get and the results that you probably can get from it, it's huge. Yeah. Always have that's that. like baseball, like, uh, being, being like with baseball players, like the second you take, you, you take out like your pocket radar for a med ball throw like it's like similar to running a flying 10 with lasers and without lasers like running a flying 10 without lasers would be ridiculous right almost ridiculous mm -hmm. running a flying 10 with lasers is awesome same thing i take as soon as you take out a pocket radar it's like hey eight pound med ball shot but throw as hard as you can we'll measure every rep you break 30 it's awesome 30 miles per hour you're 27 28 you know so the intentionality is just like through the roof as soon as you turn into a measurable yeah, that I, I'm glad you mentioned that with the pocket radar on the med ball. That's something I've never been able to do just because I, well, I have had been around the pocket radar and med balls, but watching people every time you watch someone throw a med ball into the wall, like just to do it, like, like you said, with the same mentality right. as if you were going through, hey, go sprint through these two gates, but you're not going to get your time. Just go, I don't know, try to look pretty or try to feel good, you know, whatever. I mean, and again, there is some technical value for sure. I mean, I, I will do workouts where it's a little bit more technical, but at the end of right. the day, if you are not, 
getting into a time at some way, shape or form, like some way to express and compete. And I think people forget about that with med balls. I think it's really apparent with sprinting. If you have the gates, get out the gates at some point. But med balls is where I think a lot of people do leave that on the table. I think logistically, if there was like a a logistically easy, and I, I guess pocket radar is not like difficult, but I don't know. Part of it is like the logistics of me, but I would love to be able to measure every med ball throw, but it's just like the logistics of it sometimes are just like, ah, do I have an intern stand there? Like, how does that work? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's like bringing in parts like the staff, like if you have your Dobo or some or whoever, just literally standing there, just pressing the button, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, that's like the, um, like i guess the the idea of the intern do, doing the the menial task like you have to do this menial task yeah. for three months and then you can do something you know it's like kind of like stocking the fridge just hold the hold the pocket radar and measure everyone's medicine it is a lot harder too it's I, valuable I, it's valuable yeah it's almost like you know the efficiency perspective maybe it's like hey do at least get two of your throws timed or something like yeah. that you know or yeah right something like that so you know even with the score and, and i know we we're going to get into this anyways um but with like Force plates, like depth drops, landings. I am curious, mm-hmm. like, and this may be tuning into a little bit more of the kind of the formal questions I had planned, but uh, like, just like elasticity metrics, uh, what thoughts do you guys have on those differentiating factors from things you're measuring in the, the force plate, the plyometric world, and how that um, contrasts, or, or if there is relation to things that you're seeing with the barbells and, and the gym based world? Yeah, it's a good question. It's kind of been my like, rabbit hole i've been on for probably a little bit over a year now and i really started reading the book forced by dan cleather and like he just had ideas in that book that were kind of contrary to what i've thought before so i just started doing self experiments on the force plates and the first one i did was like a a trap bar deadlift at it was around like 80 percent, and then i did like drop catches which is just standing at the top holding a trap bar dropping slamming the brakes and I looked at the force that was created and I did the 80% trap bar deadlift. I'm straining. Like it feels like I'm like, I'm putting so much force into the ground. And then I do a drop catch with 150 less pounds. And don't get me wrong. Like it's not an easy exercise to do, but then looking at the force that was created in those two movements, I was like, this is not what I was expecting. It was like 3000 newtons for the, the, um, 80% trap bar deadlift and like 4000 newtons for the way lighter drop catch. And I was just like, what is going on? So I kind of just like, began experimenting with those things and then that's how it started and then i started looking at like depth drops and that blew my mind because i was dropping off and i just actually just did this recently just like more experience experiments with myself but like i dropped off a 48 inch box and hit like 9500 newtons and it's just like that seems significant enough in terms of like force production that there has to be something worthwhile here and i i have a close friend Matt Aldred, who's also like doing this stuff. And he's been doing it with some of his guys throughout this preseason period. And he has guys hitting like 1200 newtons of force and depth drops, depth drops off like a 42 inch box. So I'm just thinking like, there has to be something relevant here because these seem pretty significant, uh, numbers that we're getting. Um, so I think that going down that rabbit hole, discovering things, and then also comparing it back to the sport that I work with. And it's like, you see guys practice, you see some plays they make, you see some moves they make. And it's like running full speed, a Euro step around a guy and finish. And it's like almost, it almost reminds me of like a low level triple jump. And it's like, Mm -hmm. you think about triple jumps and I'm thinking about a triple jump and I'm like, I don't know the force that's created in a triple jump, but watching people do it, it has to be astronomical amounts of force and then i see like a low level of that in like a euro step and it's like i need to be able to prepare them to produce that force but also be like resilient to the magnitude of force that they're probably being exposed to um so that's what my rabbit hunter hunter what is the actual force number of a single leg depth drop from like a 24 yeah so i did this the other day single leg depth drop off, off a 24 that i got is a little over 5,000 newtons. But what's interesting is that it's going to be so variable because the strategy that you use to land is going to change things drastically. I've done that too, where I've like intentionally dropped off the same level box with different strategies of landing and the force is all over the place. Like I go from as compliant of a landing as possible 
to like Joel, what you talk about with like your drop legs, like I've done those. The same level box compliant landing is like 2000 newtons drop legs. I'm at like 7,000. So the strategy that you use to land is going to be vitally important. And to the last point is kind of like this idea that I've been thinking about is like this new, and this might be getting off a tangent drill from your original question, but I'm trying to just like hit the points of uh, depth drops and then we can talk about whatever, but this new idea of like a new one rep max of like seeing what's the ap- absolute force um, producing capacity of the overall system and the exercise that I've seen produce the most from myself and like friends that have done it as well with their athletes is depth drops. Um, and what I found is that in the way that I like, I, I ran the protocol myself is I just dropped off various levels of boxes, increasing height. And as you increase height, peak force is going to go up. But once you get to a certain level of box, peak force is not going to go up. And I feel like whether it's your force producing capacity or like your the governors that your system that your system has, whatever Golgi tendon organs, whatever it may be, there's a capacity. Like I get to a 48 inch box and I hit 9,500 newtons. I go to a 50 inch box and I hit like 8,500 newtons. I try to land as stiff as possible at that 58 inch box and I can't beat 9,500 newtons. So to me, that's like my capacity. I've done it with athletes, some of the walk-on guys so far, they get to 8,000 Newtons. I increase the box height, they get 7,200 Newtons. I, hey, let's go back down, land as stiff as possible, land as stiff as possible, 8,000 Newtons, 7,800 Newtons, mm. 7,900 Newtons. So it's like, there's potentially some clues there to assessing like overall force producing capabilities because you're not going to get that in a one rep max. You're not going to get that in a IMTP. You're not going to get that in a drop catch like the the forces that I see in these depth drops is the the most that I've seen in any exercise. Yeah, the IMTP. Remind me what that is again. So it would be like the, the isometric mid thigh pull. Oh, that's where... what I thought. I was like, for some reason, I couldn't put the letters together in my head. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. like, I had the picture <laughs> in my head, but I like, I couldn't. I like my, my brain was slipping on the actual because I was curious. Or like a single leg. Um, that's what I would yeah. have been curious too. Is like, you know, Alex and Atera had talked about. Uh, like the the gateway to his um, ISO program was like a instead of a double leg um, mid thigh pull it was like a single leg with a mm. mid distance runner or something like that and that was and she was averse to the gym or something and that was the primary strength exercise and it really helped her out and but it is interesting to think about where are the big torque moments with doing that you know that probably being I, I guess it depends if your heels off the ground but more even still maybe a little more hip um, and then a drop landing on the other hand. Like if your foot can't do it, like you're done, like you're, it, that's that, the yeah, biggest link. That's a far. good point. That could, that could be like the governor as well, because I think that your body does hit a wall of like, okay, I'm not going to produce more force than what this allows. And maybe it is the foot because obviously that's the only thing that comes in contact with the ground. I've never even thought about that, but um, yeah, it very well could be. Yeah. Um, what is the actual number of like a belt squat, belt attachment? overcoming iso like from your hip as opposed to your hands do you know the actual numbers uh i don't know like the actual like ratio i know for myself what it's been and it's i think that not to put my strength levels out there for everybody to know how weak i am but (laughs) i think my intp like with straps um was around four thousand newtons and then with the belt attachment was around six thousand newtons and then like I said, dropping off a 48 inch box, the highest force I could find off a depth drop was 9,500 newtons. Um, and different strategies overcoming versus more of like the eccentric, like yielding action in the depth drop. But I just want to find like what is the maximal for force producing capacity of like my system, of the system, um, which maybe it's the wrong rabbit hole to go down, but that's kind of like the the tangent I'm on right now of, of assessing. Cause I just think like, a, what, a traditional one rep max, you're not assessing like maximal force producing capabilities, especially because it's just a concentric one rep max, which we know is like the weakest muscle action. So just all these thoughts have kind of led me to this place. Today's podcast is sponsored by the Plyomat. The Plyomat is a jump testing device that allows you to instantly receive ground contact times, jump heights, reactive strength measurements, and more in your training populations. It's easy to use, accurate, and affordable, 
And an awesome feature that I love about the plyo mat is it easily allows the connection of not just one mat, but you can string multiple mats together for use in things like multi-hurdle hops and bounding situations. I absolutely love the plyo mat, recommend it. And to check it out, you can head to plyomat.net. That's P-L-Y-O-M-A-T dot net. Yeah, I, um, the, the, the height was interesting. You mentioned like when you get above a certain height and the rate of force development doesn't necessarily get any higher. And I think that it, it's important in the sense of like, I mean, you could, if you really wanted to probably get up on an eight or nine foot box and just make it work somehow, you probably wouldn't have too many reps and you're, you know, uh, we could all use so many reps of that. And, but it just shows not only are you landing with lower quality, but the, the, even the peak force isn't as high. And it is something to think about. It's almost like as if your foot calf complex, let's say it has a you know, fictional, you know, 3000 units max output. And that 3000 units can be expressed pretty easily up to, I don't know, maybe like a, you know, 48 inch box or whatever. But then as soon as you go to 60, your, your foot and calf isn't going to give you anymore. And now it's got to be, well, I got to fold it to hit more, or I have to do this. And I've been thinking about that a lot ever since I did the podcast with Brady Volmering and he was talking about his, um, you know, he got up to six feet on a single leg, which it, it is so interesting too. I mean, you have to have a lot of hip. You can't, I would like to see the person who would go off a single leg and land on six feet and, and not have to go way forward at the hip to dampen it, you know, cause you do think, all right, you have that max force producing capacity at the lower leg and now you have to work around that in a very coordinated manner. Just long story short, though, is doing those myself after or more of those um, as a potentiation for like just sprinting has been amazing. Like it, it, it gives me some of the best potentiation um, that I've found for something that is also single leg. And I think doing uh, the podcast with like John Garish and Rich Burnett with the plyo mat and talking about that, mm. that got me really on. I've been messing with single leg RSI for a while since I talked with Rich about that a while ago, but that has been amazing. But I've found that if it's above a certain height of box, like there's no more, I don't feel like I'm able to hit that punch landing. Like once on a single leg, and I'd be curious what I, you know, could have done when I was like 25 or something. But now at age 40, like I'll get up to, you know, about 30 inches on the box, do a little hop off. If I go anything above 30 inches on a single leg, I can tell my body is just folding more to make the landing happen. It didn't have that, but you improve by getting up to 30, 33, 36 and having that like quality. And it's probably nice to have the force plate because it at least gives you a number, but there's also the feel. I mean, I work off the feel aspect because I don't have a force plate, but it's, um, you kind of confirmed what I was already thinking a little bit, you know, just in doing that myself, I've been programming it to people over the last year as well. It's gone real well with that piece. Um, I think the single leg I like too, because I, I feel like there's less room to hide, you know, in that um, versus a double. I'm just curious. Did, did you mention was it double leg you were doing primarily or single leg? Um, I've done I've done primarily uh, bilateral, <laughs> but I have like some unilateral drops recently just to see. Um, but one thing that I was thinking about when you were kind of like talking is people talk about like a speed reserve. And then I've seen Damian Harper start to talk about like a deceleration reserve. Mm. But I also think that there could be something about like a force reserve of like, okay, so you hit, uh, let's say 4,000 Newtons on your single leg depth drop at 30 inches. Well, like you train with some of these, like maybe they're drop catches, maybe they're more drops, but maybe now you're 4,500 Newtons. And now you have like more of like a force reserve, whether it's for injury mitigation mm. or actual yeah. like force production in your sprints and your accelerations, whatever it may be. But maybe there's like something there too of like this this force reserve in the same realm of like a speed reserve. I could totally see that. Yeah, like you know, we talk about landing. It's like ah, oh, let me teach you the perfect landing technique or whatever, right? But it's like I would find it far more valuable to have in each leg a substantial force reserve. And it, what is interesting, and Mike, I want to ask you a question about this. Maybe more related to the RSI. I've seen you doing some RSI single leg pieces, um, and. The, the drop is interesting because especially on a single leg versus, and a double is like this too, but you really feel it in a single, is to absorb the landing on a single leg straight drop, your knee actually has to go over your toe a little bit. Like you have to get a little dorsiflex, whereas a lot of like single leg takeoffs, even sprint steps, the dorsiflex will not last that long. You won't dorsiflex and put force down on the ground for that long, but in a single leg drop straight up, you have to because otherwise 
you, I don't know your Achilles might roll up or something like, you know, you have to find yeah. your, your foot is finding the right way to do that. And so, but when you do like a single leg RSI test, you aren't in dorsiflexion as long. And so I am curious, uh, Mike, what your experience has been, uh, like single leg RSI type work. I've seen you doing some of that, uh, and your thoughts on how that correlates with some of this. So one, one of the things that I have recently been kind of starting to mess around with is like a horizontal RSI where I'll have an athlete start just behind a jump mat that's just in front of a tape measure and they'll do a single leg, like a hop onto the jump mat as fast off the jump mat as possible into a, like a double leg landing, um, going forward into a broad jump and just this ratio between contact times and flight times. Um, and then the correlation between, you know, RSI, like a vertical RSI and, and top speed is incredibly high, right? High RSI, high top speed. And it was just really an experiment to see, is there a correlation between hmm. horizontal RSI and acceleration? And in my very limited um, science experiment, it was like every, every person that I tested, the person with the best horizontal RSI was the best accelerator and the person with the worst horizontal RSI was also the worst accelerator. So Interesting. What, did I have enough people to create a actual takeaway? Maybe not. Yeah, you know, statistical maybe I have to do that power. A few yeah. more hundred times before I feel. It. Yeah, maybe I do that for more hundred times. But um, it just got me thinking in 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 that respect, and and I think that like as a stimulus, like the RSI is such a good test anyway. So even if like you're just testing it, the actual training stimulus of an RSI is phenomenal, right? And I'm like, okay, maybe there is something to the horizontal RSI because you know direction of force application is also now super important. You know, and if you can hit the ground in a somewhat direction, stay stiff. Whereas a vertical RSI, like there's no challenge to the direction; it's just completely vertical. So maybe the stimulus, because it's like a one hop, and like a RSI is a four or five or ten. You know, yeah. maybe the vertical RSI is still a bit more valuable, but maybe there's something to creating that more horizontal stiffness, directional stiffness for something that's more correlated to acceleration. If that makes sense. Yeah. I'd be interested to see those people who are the best at the horizontal RSI and their their fly times as well, like their upright sprinting, just yeah. because there is still to have a good even horizontal RSI, there still has to be that fast, you know, limited quick time vertical impulse too. Um, yeah, I yeah, and, and most of those most of the people that were like really good at like the horizontal were in like the 0. 0.245, 0. 0.26 contact time on the jump mat, and then still getting out to like six seven feet on broad jump. Wow. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure if you look at like contact times on like a sprint step, that's like pretty close to like the second step in a sprint. Like I'm pretty sure you're about 0.3 seconds off the ground in the second step of a sprint. So um, there's definitely something to the relationship there, uh, but definitely like would require me to test yeah. many, many more athletes before I felt good about it. Yeah. And you'll have to remember, I'm sorry, my, um, I didn't catch, was that a, a single leg or a double leg? Um, the way you did that test? Single leg. So okay. it's, yeah. So you're on one leg. You just hop forward onto the jump mat as fast off the jump mat as you can on one leg, and you land on two legs. Got it. Got it. But you could land on one leg. I, don't, I think there's you could you could experiment how you would want. Yeah. The interesting thing to me with that, because I, I think about, I mean, this is something I remember doing when I was 20 years old. So, like, this is an old test. And sometimes the old tests are the golden ones, too. Um, the main difference being the shin angle when the foot hits the ground is going to be totally different in this test versus acceleration. But yeah. it's just basically a... Hey, do 20 or 30 meters on one leg and see how fast you go. And yeah. the, the, I think the real powerful thing is you have to have, you have to have those quick, our, um, reactive strength, uh, force generation qualities, and you have to be able to get the leg back to the front extremely quickly hopping on one leg, which are both very helpful. It's just the, the only difference is the, the direction that the shin comes down is very different because it's going to come down a little bit more, uh, perpendicular to the ground because of the nature of a single leg. I would like to meet the athlete that could do a single leg. 30 meter hop and have like you know shin angles that were uh pointed forward a little bit to propel them with that instant horizontal that would be a very interesting strategy but um it does seem like the general strength and the elasticity qualities would fit pretty well there i i kind of think about like you know what's the poor man's version too you know, like i love having the plyo mat it's like especially the two the two yeah. mats is awesome to gather that stuff but i also think well if i didn't have this and large groups, right? Like if it was like, hey, you know, a larger group too, and we were trying to get like everyone's single leg, um, you know, acceleration time or even um, I find I've been playing around too with like, you know, after a sprint workout doing like a fly 10, just single leg fly 10s. And just to yeah. also just kind of consider that muscle action, how this is playing into this. And then 
Um, yeah. So I'm just curious about your thoughts there. If you think, you know, like if you've done anything like that or single leg hopping tests for speed or anything like that, if that would be a similar um, value, I, I would imagine there'd be a lot of similarities, but there's probably a difference as well. Yeah. I think like the single, like the continuous single leg stuff, like for distance or for speed, like, I think that's so telling, right? Cause like you see the athletes who are comfortable doing it and it's night and day different from the athletes who are like, I mean, just melt into the ground and then go melt into the mm-hmm. ground, go again. And then every once in a while, I'll like experiment with more some of the like more elastic athletes that we have. And I'll have them do some kind of build up into like a single leg, like flying tent, for example. And then we have some who can like do it from like they can run ten yards like pretty fast, and then still cycle themselves into like a single leg flying mm-hmm. tent. We have some athletes who like if they have any speed into it, like they can't do it because like you said, like how fast you have to get your leg back up in front of yourself yeah. requires so much high velocity, right? So if they have any speed going into it, they can't do it. But it's like interesting to see the athletes who can carry speed into like a flying 10 and then still go through 10 yards on one leg, you know, whereas, you know, some of the more force dominant yeah. stuck on the ground athletes like would have no chance, mm. right? Yeah. It makes me think too about um, base of support. Like Alex Effer was talking about base of support on this podcast, a few podcasts back. And it makes me think about like the difference between like, um, like a track sprinters, like a Christian Coleman, who's got the world record, formal world record in the 60 meter dash. He's got a little wider base of support, runs kind of like with the toes out, a lot of like lateral side to side, straight up ability versus like someone like a Marcel Jacobs, someone who has more of a, their rectangle of base of support is more in front of them and in back of them. Like it makes bounding easier. Like he was a long jumper. It makes sure. like that. So I, I, I wonder too, because it's just strategies, right? Like someone who's, and I'm a person who has a, my rectangle is very much in front and back of myself. So I could do the single leg like thing, but it's also interesting to think about how that plays out. Cause I'd imagine people who just have that wider box, you know, they prefer wider squat, um, wide, a wider squat stance. You ask them to do that single leg fly and I, they're probably going to have they're going to have to like, it's just going to be a lot more awkward looking for them, I'm sure. So just looking at how structure plays into that is interesting and how there's not one test for every single person. But I imagine those people would do really good at like the single shot, you know, just the, like your test, right? Like yeah, the, right, the one right, shot, right. they're not, it's not going to play to the, to that aspect of their uh, physiology as much where versus like a track jumper type person. And I think something you just said, Joel, like the structure, like I just, every time we, have these conversations and it's like elastic elastic versus muscular type athletes it's like the structure just lends itself to being better at certain things you know like that christian coleman type guy who's i'm not going to say he's not elastic because he's probably like oh, yeah. a he's great mix of both in order to be able to do what he does mm-hmm. but compared to like a usain bolt or potentially marcel yeah. jacobs like probably more on like the muscular driven side of things and that contributes to him being a 60 meter dash world record holder versus not winning 100 meter dashes consistently because he's not potentially good at max velocity so i just one one thing that sticks out to me in that last conversation is just the structure and how much it dictates in terms of what you're able to do and how you're able to do it yeah yeah it's it's it definitely i i I love that that exists because i think lest we try to cram all athletes in the same box this is how you should do it's like well no you have people who have these different basis supports naturally by structure (laughs) you know it's not even necessarily i mean some of it is your lifting background but your base structure is your base structure on so many levels so uh, it's really cool to play that into it uh hunter i'm curious if you've um you know what i was just asking mike as well with like you know, outside the drops, like the RSI, like reactive strength, contact times, any setups mm-hmm. there um, or any thoughts you have to chime in with that one? I would say the only thought that I probably have is just like keying in on a four jump um, on the force plates is one of my like main KPIs. And I think what's interesting is seeing just like the strategy they use, the athlete uses to achieve the RSI number that they get, because some of them are more ground contact time dominant and some are more flight time dominant um some spend less time on the ground and don't necessarily jump as high but the proportion is pretty incredible versus some that spend a little bit more time on the ground and then uh jump a little bit higher and they might have the same rsi but the strategy they use to get there is so much different and i think that that also points to a more of like an elastic athlete or muscular driven athlete some of like there are some what I would consider like wide ISA muscular driven athletes that still have impressive RSIs, but the strategy they use to get there is so much different Yeah. Um, versus more of those like narrow elastic type athletes. 
Yeah, for sure. I've, I've been more attuned lately. And I think I've always kind of had this in my system a little bit because it's how I've always done it. But like the foot dominant versus the hip dominant reactive strength, especially the mm-hmm. vertical pogo, because the person who's got really good feet and a yeah. lot of times they're people who may even have like bigger feet and longer toes. You can see like their lever of the foot. People can't see this because I'm like angling my pen, but their heel tends to be off the ground more generally. It's almost like they're just trying to lever into that toe bridge, that high lever, and they are cranking that. And it's um, a little bit less. I know for me, it's true. Like I, <laughs> my, uh, my Kaiser jumper numbers actually got better when I, I think my, in my early thirties, when I had Achilles issues and I couldn't use my feet as much. And then my hips like took up the slack, mm-hmm. but it's interesting. Yeah. To notice those strategies and where people are really making their, their go-to there. And do you, uh, do you look at shifting programming at all basing on what you're seeing there? Or do you make any programming implications based off like the vertical versus like a drop or a horizontal or anything like that? I would say that I don't, I don't base it off of necessarily that test. Like I do throughout the off season kind of tailor like an elastic um, deficient program or a muscular deficient program, but that would probably just be one of the um, tests in my like battery of tests that I use to determine where those athletes fall. But I, I think going back to the structure pieces, you can pretty much tell when you see somebody kind of like what their structure is going to lead them to and what strategies they use. Like you can tell when, even in, in basketball, like we, I would say our team is probably, and I understand it's a spectrum. Not everybody's just like a wide muscular driven or narrow elastic driven, but like the minute somebody walks into the room, you can probably 75% of the time have a pretty good idea of like what they are, whether it's a wide or a narrow or what their strategy is. So, and also their training background and what they've been doing and what they like, what qualities they've been developing. So I would say that the RSI piece is probably like a test I use to confirm that subjective evaluation that I give each guy, um, along with some other things. But one thing that I, you mentioned the foot and I was thinking about this, um, as you said this and kind of like reading through the questions that you had, but one thing that I've always been really interested in, this goes back to even when I was like a kid. And I think it was because I like always loved watching basketball and would see like Kobe Bryant and for whatever reason, and like my family and close friends know this about me, but like calves and Achilles have always been so fascinating to me. And when I was a young kid, I think it's because I, I like basketball players that were really athletic and they always had super long Achilles tendons and really small calves. So like, Mm. for whatever reason, that's just been fascinating to me, but that's almost been like an evaluation tool is if you just look at somebody's lower leg structure Mm. and see like the length of their Achilles tendon and the length of their calf muscle, I feel like there's a ratio between elasticity and those, that ratio somewhere some form and i've it's just been a thing i've been thinking about but i've never actually like got a ruler out and measured people's achilles tendons but <laughs> yeah i think that there is something there um and that was just one thing i was thinking that kind of goes into that structure piece of if you have somebody that's kind of like in that middle ground of isa potentially and you're not really sure i think that there are there is value at just like seeing the structure of the lower leg and there are some outliers that don't necessarily that i've seen that don't necessarily fall into like the for whatever reason, don't necessarily fall into like the longer Achilles tendon being more elastic, shorter Achilles tendon being less elastic. But from the most, for the most part, it's been like pretty consistent, at least in a subjective evaluation sense. Yeah. Yeah. The foot, the, those dynamics is fascinating. I was at the zoo, um, when was this, maybe four months ago, and I was just watching the kangaroos hop around. And I was just like, what would it be like to be, you know, in the body of a kangaroo, like just feeling yourself be able to modulate gravity like that, like effort so effortlessly, but then also like trying to convey that feeling, you know, to athletes and individuals. Uh, even the other day I was messing around with this and I've, I've done this. I've never programmed this for athletes. This is kind of a, it's just a weird thing too, but maybe I will someday. It'd be more of an in-person. I don't know if I would it just the hill, like the steepness of the hill be weird, but like downhill bounding is something that I've been messing oh. with. Oh yeah. And, uh, like not like crazy. This not, it can't be like, <laughs> don't go to like a 30 degree degree grade and do this. I'm talking like, like my hill in my side yard is like, I can, I, I'm probably going to mess this up, but it might be like eight degrees or 10 degrees. So it's not crazy, but bounding downhill for the purpose of just feeling the ease, like, like I don't, don't even try, just feel how you can manage the ease in this. And one of the, you know, with what you guys were saying too, and, and Hunter, this to me fits a little bit with, you kind of talked about that point where, you know, the, the RSI isn't going to get any better. Like 
And I, my mind always goes to like, I would just call it poor man or everyday versions of this. And it brought me back to something Rob Assis um, had talked about, which was cr- yeah. crescendo or buildups. Like, and, and not just like a buildup sprint, which a buildup sprint to me is, a, it's funny because it's so staple, especially in track, but it's also really underrated. It's like, can you smoothly accelerate to top speed? But then doing that with skips and gallops, but something I've really enjoyed doing with the uh, as well, and I think Rob may have talked about this, was uh, single leg, just single leg crescendo hops. And so having athletes say, hey, uh, you're going to hop on one leg, uh, either for distance or for speed, and say, all right, you're going to start and just get faster and faster and faster. And there's going to be this point at a certain amount of yards that they just don't get any faster. <laughs> and it's probably for the same reasons that you were saying, Hunter, like, Something was not going to output any more force, probably to me, something in the foot and Achilles or in that chain, and then they're just done. And so that to me, but that's kind of like almost like if you have the yin and yang, you have the more like um, quantifiable number behind this. And then the stuff that you observe, uh, I think it's it's good to have both because that's something you observe. It's like, OK, yeah, you you crapped out at about eight yards there when it would be great if you could get to 12 or 13, you know, and there is like a strategy mail start slower or whatever. but. Um, that's been my way uh, of doing that. I do want to actually shift this a little bit because I know we've been talking about the plyo and jumping piece. And Mike, I wanted to get to something um, that I've seen you do. I know you have like 1080 access, so the quantify the numbers. Uh, but and you know, so shifting from a little bit more into more of the speed, speed mechanic type piece, is you've talked about overlaying like technique with what you're seeing in like the curves of these things. Like you see a number, you see a force curve. But then you're also looking at the things that are happening technically. And I know Michael Yesis, the, the late Michael Yesis, you know, RIP, I think he just passed away within the last yeah. month or two, um, that he had talked about the need for the biomechanical research to also have an overlay, like a 3D real-time overlay of the uh, kinematics. And so, uh, anyways, long-winded question, but <laughs> uh, tell me a little bit about how you're going into uh, looking at the technique behind what you're getting on the curve there. Uh, in the 1080 and also maybe explain a little bit about the curve too for people who might not have that um you know ready readily uh knowing that technology too yeah so i guess the the actual graphs you sprint every step is graphed and it's and there's slopes to the graph and um as like the bottom of each slope is your foot striking the ground and and ideally you have this like sharp steep um upward slope and then at the top of the graph is your foot leaving the ground and it should look fairly, it should look like some fairly nice mountains. And very rarely do you actually see fairly nice mountains. And, you know, oftentimes that has to do with something that's happening, obviously, during the sprint. And majority of majority of the time is because an athlete is spending more time on the ground. And then you kind of see these like weird kind of flatter mountains. Um, but I think, I think with that, it's, it's just tiered, you know, the feedback is always just tiered. And, and I was having this conversation with an athlete the other day because I had showed them some stuff about the graph in the 1080 and we were kind of talking about it a little bit and he did a sprint and we were working on some, I don't even remember what we were working on, but he came out of the sprint and the first question he asked was like, Hey, like how'd that look on the graph? And I'm like, wait a second. Like if that's the first question you have mm-hmm. coming out of your sprint, then this is a miscommunication on my part. The first thing that we should do is how did that feel? Like that's tier number one. Tier number two is like, okay, how did it look from my perspective? And then our third tier can be like, okay, let's look at the graph and did that align with how you felt and, and uh how it looked right so um you know very oftentimes like how it looks how it feels that's going to align with the graph and the graph is just there to kind of help us understand that and now when i'm like when i'm sprinting by myself and i took up the 1080 like i'll use that actual grass because it's watching me right so i don't have that feedback from anybody else and so i'm like okay how that feel okay let me go look at the graph and and actually last night i was working with a lacrosse player and he we were, we were doing some accelerations in 1080 and he did a sprint and his sprint looked really good. I'm like, oh, that looked really good. And I looked down the 1080 and the graphs were like very asymmetrical. Hmm. I'm like, like, that did not look like what I just saw out of the actual sprint. So on his second rep, I just like stood behind him. I was like, maybe looking from the side was not super indicative because clearly something was wrong. And as soon as he started second rep looking from behind him, like his left foot was like, re- like he's a fairly pigeon toed human being. But his left foot was like really internally rotating when he like was going to toe off. So from the side, it looked totally normal. Mm. But then actually looking at the graph, like I saw that something was wrong. Therefore, I just changed what my perspective was and I could tell why it was so different. And, you know, lo and behold, he had left ankle, lateral ankle sprain issues in the past and, and whatever. And, and so just having it kind of be tiers of information, you know, it's not something that I rely on. It's just, okay, how does it feel? How does it look? And then do those things align with what the actual graph looks like? 
And then just, I think there's a lot you can kind of dive into the graph, but I think you can also kind of get lost in the graph as well, because, you know, you can also get confused as to making sure, is it actually like speed and time? Is it distance and time? Is it force and time? So there's a lot of different uses for it, um, but just making sure that's kind of tiered in terms of the actual information, the input you get back to the athletes. Today's podcast is sponsored by Team Builder. Team Builder is an online software for coaches and trainers, and I've continued to hear great things about the Team Builder platform. If you're looking for either an in-house training portal for your training groups or an online training hub, be sure to check out the Team Builder training software. Yeah, I love that. I, I do. I think it is so easy. And sometimes you even think too with like the growth of AI, you know, the chat GPT explosion, obviously all the metrics, all the things that can monitor, monitor you, could watch you, <laughs> could give you a number. I was even talking about this with Austin Yoakum, like even with something like rhythm that's so innate to humans and the feel, but what if you put an accelerometer on someone, you got a rhythm score, you know, and then athletes, you almost had like this dystopian future where athletes are just looking at graphs, just looking at numbers. They'd say yeah. like people might be half robots someday playing a sport. It's like, you know, I, I, to avoid that dystopia, like, you know, that always having that core of who we are, like feel, see, observe, even that right. idea we were talking right. about you know, interns a little bit before the show. And I think that, you know, in designing almost like a, a strength and, and sports performance and movement curriculum, like learning to observe first and then having the data come in versus I think a lot of times it's the other way around. And, you know, that, and even too, yeah, I mean, you yeah. could get like as meat headed about as you want, you know, you could think about like, I'm going to, if you just look at like someone's back squat numbers, you know, it's like, Hey, I squat at 315 at the start of the phase. I squat at 350 at the, at the end of the phase. But at the end of the phase, you know, I did it by doing basically a good morning, did 350 mm -hmm. up, right? So you can, it's really anything in the world of performance and anything in just the whole world. So, yeah. From the feel aspect of things, it's been interesting to, like, I'm frequently time, weekly timing like 515s with my guys. And it's really interesting to have a guy run his best time. And, they're like, what, what was it? What was it? And it was, it's just really mm -hmm. interesting to ask the question, like, how did it feel? Like, did you yeah. feel fast in that rep? And it's interesting to notice how like intuitive they are to be like, yeah, that felt really fast. And it's like, yeah, you just hit a, a PR of two hundreds, you know, like that question is, is really interesting to hear their response because they can feel it. And then there's also situations where it's like, dang, that was fast. I was like, okay, hey, you were a 10th slower than I yeah. usually run but i think that like 90 percent of the time there's this intuitive sense of like how it felt to them and now it's like how do you harness that so they feel that every time yeah which there's a lot of things that go into that the t whatever like just the the nature of of different sprints but how can you harness that feeling yeah that's the big one that you know i've been getting into every year i get more into motor learning and then not just that but like retention like i've found just in the realm of sprinting there's been a lot of times i can like pop one sprint out that's like a 10th, if it's like a 30 meters or something, I can pop one sp uh, sprint out that's quite a bit faster, but then I can't repeat that very easily, like easily, fluidly, and and also even trying to find things that I felt. Uh, one of the things I've been playing around with is amplifying the error, which has honestly been one of the best ways I have found. Like if you amplify the error in let's say a sprint two or three times, and then you go and do a normal sprint. The normal sprint is so good. But then trying to remember what that felt like and then go back to it has been the trick, you know. But I, I will say, Hunter, you something you said, um, I think is really interesting is when it feels fast or good, but it wasn't good. Like what's going on? I know for me personally, yeah. a lot of times you know, in the past, this is just for like top end, like a flying 10, this would happen all the time. Like really trying to hit those big like shapes, like get the knee up, step over the, uh, step over the knee. Um, you know, like all those stepping over a run tall, high knee, there's a lot of energy. Like if you do that really fast, it feels kind of good and fast, but then I would do it and I would see the time and I was like, what? Like <laughs> I would get so frustrated. And so it is that to me, that is that piece that I think is so helpful because learning to, and I think you could even like assisted sprinting is probably a great place for this yeah. too, where you can feel the ease in running fast notice what your body did to go fast uh if you're towed at your you know current max or whatever and try to make it easy i think there's a lot of value to that and 
I think we often hear about that as just a number, just tow it, you know, max velocity, but make it feel easy or something. You know, I know you guys probably do. I know, um, I know, Mike, I think I've seen you do the overspeed type work. I'm curious of any thoughts you guys have on the reverse. Yeah, like the towing, um, not being, not, not towing something, being towed <laughs> and the feeling or, or how to work with that and how to work that into the equation. I, I love um, overspeed stuff or not overspeed. I love mm-hmm. assisted work. Um, and I know some people in the speed realm don't necessarily love it as much. Um, I think that obviously the 1080 is unique because it gives you such a controlled, perfect pull. Um, but even like doing sub-maximal ass, uh, assisted work, I think is super valuable. As, you know, especially for like athletes who are more like muscular and force driven, just to like help them kind of drive some kind of elastic response and let them feel kind of more bouncy without having to strain through an acceleration. You know, and so you know, I think that any like anytime I I want to run a really fast flying 10. Like I'm going to pull myself with like three or four kilograms first mm-hmm. and I just let it rip. Cause like, that's, I've never felt faster than coming out of something like that. Um, and I think it's like, I think it has more uses than just like forward sprinting. Like, mm-hmm. like you said, I think there's some value to potentially doing some kind of bounding action. Um, or I'll do like dribbles into a run or, or like a straight leg bound or decelerations assist. So I think there's so many different uses to actually assistance, but I think it, it drives like an elastic response as well as anything that there is within sprinting. I also think that kind of takes me back to what you said about like the drops being such a good potentiator is like you're, you're touching like a, a little bit higher output than you're actually going to probably experience in the, the quote unquote event that you're timing, testing, whatever. So I think Mike, you just said like, it's a really good potentiator for whenever you want to run fast. And Joel, you said like depth drops are a good um, potentiator potentiator as well so i think there's something and i mean i guess that's the the basis of what potentiation is but i think both can be pretty powerful but i also like it like even when i even when i feel like garbage and like sometimes i like just want to pull myself like i'm top speed day and i feel like garbage i'm like i don't want to run at top speed today because i don't feel good but i want to do some kind of speed so i'll just pull myself with two kilograms like not super hard pull i won't run as fast as i can but like it'll feel good because i'm being towed you know and it's it'll feel way better than me trying to do like I don't know, sprint float sprints or wicked runs or whatever I might have chosen that top speed day just because the energy required for that is is way more and this will feel way better. And I think that some like that you kind of introduced me to is whenever I think of like overspeed or assisted sprinting, it's what I always like think of. The first thing that pops in my head is just like max velocity stuff where you get a guy to run whatever, 22 miles an hour that only runs 21, whatever. But something that I think is really interesting, I think about be powerful in my space, excel, especially in such like an acceleration based sport is your assisted accelerations, even from like a dead stop. Like, I think that piece is really interesting. Do you do as much of that as you do with like the assisted more max velocity stuff? Or would you say that it's mostly the assisted max velocity stuff? Uh, I've played around with the assisted acceleration stuff. I don't love it as much. Uh, Like for myself specifically, like I'm a bad, like I'm a bad striker, like in my acceleration. And when you put, when you pull yourself in an acceleration, like you just eliminate the need to strike the ground well. So like for me, it's like just making the thing I'm bad at completely unnecessary. So I don't love it for me. I think there are some uses for it. Um, like I think, like I had a girl the other day who we were doing some short acceleration stuff and we were like at the end of a phase and I wanted her to hit some fast time. She felt great. And she was a very like turnover heavy athlete. And I'm like, you know what? Like let's pull you on like five or six kilograms in a short sprint and let's have you go do a short sprint. Like let's play into the fact that you turn over really fast. and like. She loved the feeling of, of being like, she, she turns over hard. She loves the feeling of being pulled even harder. And then we went and did a short sprint and she, she ran, she's a high school, high school track athlete. And, and she ran like a one three Oh five fifteen, which for a high school track athlete is, is really, really fast for a short acceleration. So there's definitely use for it. I don't use it as much though. Cause I think for some athletes, it's actually uh, potentially a negative, but where, whereas like over or assisted running top speed, I think is pretty much awesome for everybody. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It'd be interesting too, like you mentioned, like the athlete says it feels good and to also have like kind of in your pocket of things or, you know, how to prescribe the times to say, you know, that like, how comfortable are you with feeling, uh, being pulled at this velocity? I I can speak to that real quick because I, uh, visited Mike at TC, I was there for the, the combine, whatever month that was. And I came up TC Boots and me and Mike were just working out and he was like, let's do I, at that point, I had not been sprinting a ton. Like at this point, I think I'd much be much better prepared for it, but 
we were just doing some speed work, whatever, sprinting, running through the lasers, doing some stuff on the 1080. And then he's like, let's do some assisted stuff. Mike, what was it? 10 kilos that you pulled me at? I, I did pull my 10. Not to say that disclaimer for the story is I never actually pull anybody at 10 kilograms, <laughs> but we had done an episode with, uh, yeah, we, well, we done an episode with Kyle Samuels and he had talked about that during his RTP for some of his guys at, at UW, he had gotten them to 10 kilogram pull. So I was like, Hey, you want to actually feel it, Hunter? And so, which I, if you haven't felt 10 kilogram over speed pull, it's like, it's ridiculous how hard it is. So yeah, Hunter, Hunter was getting picked on that. It was incredible. I already was feeling like a little tight. My hamstring was a little tight, but I, I, yeah, I tried it out and it was, it's scary. It's like the same feeling you get when you're dr- about to drop off like a 70 inch box. <laughs> yeah. I, I kind of wonder too, part of me would wonder the psychology behind athletes who like the fastest pull, like, you know, kind of like you know, even the like Christian TV, like neurotyping, do you like, like extreme sports? Mm. Are, is that your type of personality? And they're like, yeah, crank it up as high as it goes. Or, or you wonder if they just like that because they like the rush and then their mechanics actually really fall apart versus how, um, what percent over speed can you maintain mechanics? And maybe that also fits with just your overall coordination there. But I, I do want to ask, um, and this, uh, this will be like kind of the final area or question, and maybe a little bit different than what we've been talking about. But I think it's just really interesting to see the way that people have taken like play, exploration, agility, aliveness in training, especially in the warm-up area. Um, tell me a little bit about each of your kind of story there and some things that you've done and, and uh, put in your program in that realm in like the last three, five years or whatever it's been. Yeah, I would say that for me, the way I think naturally is more of like an analytical objective type feel. And I think evaluating my own programming and like the way I, way I go about things is that's easy for me. And that's always going to be in my program, but understanding that I need the other side of things and like the aliveness and the subjectivity and, and that aspect of training, I felt like games and some of like the human stuff I do, I think kind of like brings that out. Um, but for me, it's kind of just like understanding the population I work with. They're hyper competitive. They don't necessarily love to do traditional training but i think that if i can bring a session alive early on we just get so much more out of it later because they're almost just like feeding off that adrenaline the rest of the time and it's like yeah i'll do the work i'm gonna have a little bit more intent because of the adrenaline that i got before i also think that like finding ways to within within basketball it's pretty much universal i'm sure some teams are very different maybe if you like however you want to structure it but I run a warm up for the team pre practice every day. And finding ways to infuse games in that space, everybody loves it. I started this last year and it was like, and this was in the G League, but it was like still professional basketball players. And I was like, we're going to play Sharks and Minnows to warm up today. I was like, I'm just going to do it and see what happens. Maybe the coaching staff is going to be like, what the hell is this guy doing? Maybe the players are going to be like, what? But I just, hey, we're going to, one guy in the middle, we're going to play Sharks and Minnows. And I did not have any idea how it was going to go. And all these players just turned into like middle schoolers and they're like laughing and giggling and like making fun (laughs) of each other and running around. And it's like, okay, if, if this population can feel the benefit from this, there has to be something to it. Mm -hmm. So then that just got me thinking of like, how can I infuse this into each portion of training sessions, whether it's a pre-practice warm up, whether it's a, a lift, whether it's just something before we do speed work. So going back to the analytical side is like creating lists of like, this is going to be my off season games, whether it's going to be a warm up or all the way to like a three V one tag, where I think that we're actually going to get some like agility deceleration qualities out of it. And then I also have a section for like pre weight room stuff where maybe it's limited space. I don't want as much movement, but maybe we're like throwing tennis balls or doing some partner combative type stuff. And then it's also the pre practice stuff to where it's, I have a big space. I have, 15 to 17 guys i have limited implements i don't want to be too crazy um in terms of just like all out tag wherever you want to go but putting constraints to actually drive some aliveness drive some engagement but also make sure that it's not going to get somebody hurt right before we start practice so i've kind of sectioned it in that way um and it's not like every day we're going to play basketball tag pre-practice um but i just infuse it when i think that it's something that the guys need at that moment um whether it's 
they're feeling super tired. They walk in the gym, they look like a bunch of zombies. It's like, Hey, maybe that maybe it's the day, maybe today's the day I throw on basketball tag, um, and go about it that way. Yeah. I think I would say that, um, a lot of similarities between, between Hunter's answer. And, and I guess like the two kind of anecdotes I'll give is, uh, there's this one of the, one of the athletes that we train with, he, uh, has had a couple of years in the NFL, he's offensive lineman. And last year he had a USFL contract, finished his USFL season, like four weeks of training. And then he was uh, in an NFL training camp and he ended up getting cut and he was, he was back here and he's been training. And, and I was talking to him a little bit and he was like, the, like the thing that is always the, biggest learning curve for me going back into that environment is just like quickly the game is played and my ability to like to perceive and react to guys and it just like takes me a few days to like get back into the quickness of the game and the speed of the game and you know he and like when he's back home like he's not playing football right like there's nowhere he can go to find adequate you know football level at nfl right so um so there's always like a need for me to feel like i want to incorporate some kind of game-based competition and for those guys though like i want to be super safe about it because the last thing i want obviously mm-hmm. is them to get hurt playing some goddamn game in our weight room right so um and the, and the unique part about my situation is that i have the ability to really experiment on people because you know like when i work with and this is something Hunter and i've talked about like when i work with middle schoolers like i do my best to be as creative as possible in every game situation you know it's like the structure that I use is like something that I like took from like Trevor Harris when he talks about like fun, focused, fun, right? So like we'll start with some kind of gameplay. We'll do something more focused. We'll finish with some kind of gameplay. And so within those gameplay sections, I try to be as creative as possible. And and I've had some bad moments, you know, when, you know, like we had a kid break an arm playing tag. So I've had some bad <laughs> moments. He was fine and he still trains here. So like <laughs> clearly the experience is solid, but um, I've had some bad moments. But then like you take some of those experiments. I'm like, okay, they worked with middle schoolers. Let me apply them to the high schoolers, mm-hmm. you know? And then, okay, they work with the high schoolers. Can I just keep going up a level until I know it's safe enough and competitive enough where I can, you know, ask some of these pro athletes to do it too. So super, super important. And it's part of, it's part of every single day. And, and I just think it's, it's fun in the private sector to just be able to use kids to experiment because they're going to have a great experience no matter what, even if it's like a weird game that you're just kind of like making up as the first time you're doing it, they're, they're, they're going to enjoy it. So, yeah. That that's definitely one of the things with the private sector that you do get, like, like you just said, the ability to go through the ages. And for me, I have a huge gap. Like for me, it's like I coach five-year-old, six-year-old soccer players, probably playing some of the same games you might play with the middle schoolers. Right. But then, you know, you'll, you'll get that in the system and then be like, you know, then my next gap up though is like 20 years old, 18 years old, those kind of things. So it's, uh, you right. know, it's, it's, but I think it does still, even like Hunter, what you said, like, you know, you're playing these games with college basketball players. And they love it. It's like you're a kid again. And I think it's almost like if you polarize, it's like just stuff you did when you were a kid. That's fun. So, but it is, it is really interesting to see how that would go um, throughout. And, and you're right. It is, it's almost like there's this, the art is the line between no zombies, like Rhett, uh, Rhett Larson says, no zombies are the hashtag. And then someone got hurt and you have to explain to the coach why this individual got hurt. I actually, I did um, my, um, when I was coaching at Wilmington College. So I've always been like this. This was, shoot, this was 15 years ago, uh, almost. We I started warming up with more and more games. Uh, we would always have a game day in the in the off season training. It would be Wednesday. We'd play ultimate frisbee, which was partially an excuse for me to just go out and play ultimate frisbee because I wanted to play. And I'm, the sprinters, I would just throw them bombs and just have them try to chase them down and whatnot. And that was to me that was also a kind of like hands on control of their training in some perspective. Right. But um. I would do, we started moving, it was like my third or fourth year out of four there, we started doing, instead of one day, we would just warm up for a speed day with, hey, 20 minutes of ultimate Frisbee. And we didn't even, we didn't even warm up before. It's just like, just start throwing the Frisbee around, you know, and, and that worked really well. People really loved it. And then one day, a guy who was all American and high jumped the year before goes and sprains his ankle. I think it was a repeat mm. sprain, you know, and it wasn't terrible, but like <laughs> it was, he re-aggravated something playing and you know, I, I think he continued to struggle actually for the rest, for, a, I think a variety of reasons. It wasn't just that. And sometimes, you know, like you also can bring in that to me, actually, it got me thinking about more global stuff like risk reward and life in general, like safetyism, you know, like, and, and that kind of thing, like, especially maybe if it's more of a, um, like a middle school and high school group, you know, what versus like, Hey, this is a protein, <laughs> you know, obviously the dial is different. I feel like, you know, the, the, the safe versus, um, free play dial is certainly different, but it's uh, yeah, it's just fun to hear what different people do and and how you consider that audience in front of you to to have that trigger for the engagement. 
And I the the risk versus reward space or piece in the space that I've worked in recently is like something I'm constantly thinking about. Mm-hmm. And it's like, is the engagement, aliveness, intent that I'll get from this worth the slight risk? Because obviously, if I just go through like a hey, jog down and back, all right, quad stretch, all right, la- there's probably pretty much a zero percent chance of anybody getting hurt. The minute I start playing tag or whatever it may be like the risk does go up and i constantly am trying to figure out like is this whatever again not to use the same word a million times but aliveness that i'll get from this tag game pre-practice worth it and i've almost thought like asking coaching staff like would you rather me play a game and have there be in it an obvious risk of potential slight injury and have the guys like a little bit better for the beginning of practice or do you just want me to do the most mundane get them ready they're probably going to be a little zombie in the first drill and then like I've, I've thought about asking that question because there is just that inherent risk but i just i and as i'm alluding to like i do play those games so i think that the reward is worth the risk um but it is something that I'm constantly thinking about and it does kind of stress me out. It causes me anxiety every time I'm about to play a game. Like before I'm about to play Sharks and Minnows with the team last year, I was just like, oh, I don't know how this is going to go. Let's just send it and see what happens. <laughs> send it. Yeah, it's like even too in, in the NCAA, you have, you know, revenue sports versus non-revenue sports as well. Yeah. Like I would do that stuff with tennis and the coaches, like the assistant coach actually loved it. I might have even yeah. asked him one time because I don't know, maybe somebody like, you know, n- it wasn't seriously hurt, but maybe like half half tweaked an ankle one day or something like it wasn't bad but i think i'm trying to you know um scratch my memory banks here but i want to say that the coach had said you know this is fun let's do this this is okay you know and you know no one no one ever got i never had the only bad one was that high jumper that turned his ankle playing ultimate and i i guess i think about how many hours i've had athletes play games and that was the worst and that was you know that was about 14 years or that was 12 years ago and from that yeah breaking an arm i'm sure that was a fun moment in the the gym mic when that kid broke his arm playing tag it was like it was like this it was like this huge open space tag game and i was like putting all kinds of different obstacles out and this kid was like he was like not a very fast kid so like he knew that if he was going to succeed in this big open space he would have to like do some kind of funky so like he like like was throwing himself all over the place and he happened to like dive onto the ground and and break his arm Uh, (laughs) but now when he trains Every time he comes, like, hey, can we play that game that I broke my arm on? So oh, that's awesome. He loves it. something that was experientially positive there. So, yeah, that's, I, I think, think it's, yeah. oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think it's interesting because when I first got here, um, I, the, the anxiety that implementing like some of these games caused me led me to not implementing them. And I was talking to, I was talking to Trevor Harris and he was like encouraging me because I, I was frustrated with the intent I was getting from the team in terms of their training. Mm, yeah. And I was talking to Trevor and we were just like kind of going back and forth and he was like ta- asking about that stuff. And he's big on the the gameplay and, and everything. And, and he just kept encouraging me to like, just do it, dude. Just like try it out. Just try it out. Granted, he has no skin in the game. So if somebody gets hurt, <laughs> it's no, no sweat off his back. So that's a safe space to be in. But I was like, yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. So just like in the implemented small stuff, like med ball tennis, there's not much risk there. And the, I can't measure this. I can't give you an objective number, obviously, but I do feel like the correlation of when I began to implement this gameplay with even just within the training, whether it was like pre-speed work, pre-lift, the intent and and aliveness within the actual training session after did improve. And again, I can't, maybe that's just my bias of confirming the the games that I want to play with the team. But I do feel like once I started doing that, things got a little better and it's as simple as like yeah. before some of the speed work we did like the rock paper scissors tag i took it from matt Tomitz from a from a video that he posted recently it's just like the rock paper scissor tag it's like pretty dumb they don't actually like really sprint that much mm-hmm. but just like that engagement they get from it before we go into it i think is the juice is worth the squeeze in that sense but it has been interesting to see the trajectory of the training sessions pre-games to post games and how much better i feel about the intent we actually get from the training session yeah that whole area, there's a whole skill unto itself there that really, I think, goes oh, into like sure. the physical education space. Yeah. And that's, I think, a space that is so undervalued in this kind of multidisciplinary sports performance field. And I look at like what Rhett Larson does as well. You can tell he has spent a lot of time finding a container that is going to be a lot of fun, but not a lot of risk. And even mm-hmm. myself spending time with people like, like Aaron Cantor, who was on the podcast a few episodes back, and just learning uh, play, like the art of that 
and finding ways to make even a mundane thing come alive. You know, there's just, I think there's a lot of ways you could do it, even probably in the pro space. I even think too about the stuff that like emergence, uh, Michael Zufel, Tyler Yerby, they were posting. It was just like doll rods, just having people dodge doll rods in different ways. I use that all the time, all the time. Um, Cause I'm like, I haven't had anything go wrong with that yet. Maybe there's some day I will, but there's also the question too. I mean, the head coach would never see it this way ever, but like if they got hurt playing tag, I mean, they're probably going to, there's a good chance they might go out in the court and get hurt anyways. But of course you never can make that correlation completely, but right. you know, it's, it's never going to validate itself out that way, but it, it's all, um, it's certainly all interesting to think about. So, um, well, Hey, let's, um, let's close this out. Uh, if you guys one have any closing thoughts or anything on anything we've said, and then two, uh, I know you guys have a podcast. I was actually a guest on it and it was awesome. So if you guys want to share a little bit about that, so closing thoughts, and then tell me a little bit bo- uh, more about what you guys are doing with that together. I would just say uh, my closing thought would be I really appreciate the and maybe it's just the conversations and the people I'm having the conversations with, but I'm I'm really a- appreciative of the conversations that I have. They're outside the box of traditional training. Um, and it kind of goes back to like the the interns and what they think about and what they learn. And then like the conversations I have with people like yourself or or Trevor Harris or Matt Aldred or the people I've mentioned on this podcast. And I think that the realm of sports performance is beginning to like transition away from like a power lifting centric mindset. And I think it's really powerful. And it's kind of like a, a weird space to be in because especially with some of the stuff that I'm doing, like, I don't know if it's, if it's valuable, I don't know if it, if it is going to work because it's still on the front end of things, but I think there's just so much power in being like curious and challenging the norm. And I just hate the, the quote of it's because it's always been done that way, or that's how we've always done it. And I think there's just so much power in being curious and like pushing this field forward, because I don't think the overall answer is squatting and benching and deadlifting as much as possible. Yeah, I think, um, and that's a great point, Hunter. And and then all I'll say is, is a couple of things. Number one, I think, you know, I, I have conversations with coaches and, and who are more in that same old school kind of mindset of, ignoring some of like the more content creation stuff uh because they're so focused on the actual day-to-day coaching right and and i think that um it's like i think it's the bare minimum for us as coaches to be great coaches right like if we're not great coaches then like what are we doing within the field but then on top of that it's like things that we're doing to try to like do more and i think that's why hunter and i decided to start our own podcast and our own business together which was move the needle which you uh came on and i think that in part inspired by, you know, some of the things that while you were at Cal, like you didn't need to start a podcast, you know, and, and help other people and learn more stuff. But, you know, I've probably listened to, I don't know, hundreds of episodes that you've done. Right. And I've taken away a lot of that stuff. So like, it's never, it's never something that you have to do, but I think it's just something that we both were, uh, I guess all three of us, we wanted to do, to do more than just the bare minimum of coaching every single day. And that's what, that's, what's really fun. I think, um, conversations like this are really fun. And that's what we try to do with our podcast as well. And, and uh, see if we can't, you know, stimulate some of those conversations and hopefully get more coaches to want to do more within what they're doing in their own settings. Yeah, it's always awesome to have these talks. And Mike Hunter, I hope, uh, yeah, I hope people will go and listen to uh, that. So go to Move the Needle Performance. Um, and then thank you guys for being on the show. I really, it was awesome talking to you guys and having, uh, you know, sprinting, jumping and play. Those, that's like the trifecta. <laughs> so it was great being able to talk about that. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you, Joel. Appreciate it. Thank you, Tanya. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for tuning in to another episode. I'll see you next week.